Nothing is sacred. Hello, everybody. Um, I want this to be as useful as possible. This is super odd not being able to see anybody. So I hope uh, this is all making sense. Um, but really, I guess what this was about was trying to unpack a load of uh, some of the stuff that's happened in my past, uh, but also a load of the ways we work at Uncommon and try and speak to, I guess, what it means to do what we do. Um, innovation, disruptive thinking, the act of thinking outside the norm against accepted thinking, all that other was also known as creativity. Um, I thought I'd talk a bit about that and what that might mean to all of us and try and remove the theory from some of it. Um, truthfully, uh, creatives are the most powerful people in any organisation. Um, we have the ability uh, to literally solve the problems of our world. And with that responsibility comes a bit of a pressure, which is actually a lot of us can choose to either be a dick or not be a dick. Um, when I started, I just thought I'd speak to some of this because there's some stuff in here. Um, I learned loads about it, I suppose, because the way the industry had been formed then, a bit like the way it's formed now, was was kind of traditional. I actually got my job in the job centre. Um, I didn't get to uni or any of that stuff. Uh, and I had this view of advertising that I wanted to get into it, but I didn't really know what it was. In my mind, um, there was art, which had some sense of meaning attached to it. And there was slutty amounts of cash and blagging, which in my head was sort of banking, maybe, I don't know. Um, and I had this view of advertising like it might be right in the middle, that there was this sort of brilliant place where you could blag and wang on and tell stories and be creative, but it might also have a touch of meaning in it. Turns out that wasn't actually that far from the truth. Or maybe to some degree, we all create our own realities, right? But I went into the job centre and said, look, um, do you have any jobs in advertising? And they had one. Uh, and it was as a studio junior in a company called Lintas. Um, and so I turned up two and a half hours early for this interview uh, and managed to get the job. Back then, it was mainly involved uh, spray mounting things with cancerous amounts of glue um, to boards and uh, running down the road to this place to uh, what I didn't know then, but to get drugs for lots of people. Um, uh, it wasn't just that, though. I met some really, really brilliant people there. Um, I was really lucky in my first job. To meet somebody i mean and actually at that point lintas wasn't a brilliant agency from what i could work out but there were one or two people there who were brilliant and they were really really giving uh with their knowledge with their energy you know and i learned loads man i didn't know how to have a meeting i didn't know how to order in a restaurant really you know i came from um a place called wheelstone which is a bit of a shithole uh, in zone five and essentially wasn't really sure about how to do any of this stuff. And I learned loads. And one guy took me under his wing, a guy called Simon Fairweather, who was an ex-photographer turned typographer. And so I fell into design, which I loved. Um, it got kind of crazy. Simon showed me lots of things about life, good and bad. Um, I suppose that was kind of good. The point here is maybe try and find mentors. I know everyone talks about mentoring and it's become a very fashionable word. But what I learned back then was actually a mentor in every sense you know not just the work sense but in a living sense in an approach to your day in an approach to working with people there's stuff to learn everywhere um, particularly if you haven't done the the university path um when i left lintas i got i was there like four years um i got another job which was like the first experience of oh my god i've got another job i got hired and i went through this thing where i just shit myself and i learned loads and loads of other apps and platforms including this horrendous thing here called quark express i'm sure many of you don't even know what the fuck this is but quark express was sort of like the excel of design uh, at that point but the point was the fear of me leaving spurred me into learning loads and loads and loads of more apps loads more skills and i remember simon saying to me jesus how come you leaving has got you learning you know three or four of these other platforms and you staying didn't and it dawned on me that the fear of change made me want to learn things so I was less dependent. You know, I felt more able to stand on my own two feet. And I think there's something really interesting in that. Um, 
I then moved around a little bit and then ended up in Rainy Kelly, um, which was uh, a cool place uh, founded by these people. I mean, look at the state of that tie on Jim Kelly there. Um, it's ridiculous. Um, but Rainy's was uh, a very cool place that had just sold. So these dudes had all started their own place um, and then just sold. And I eventually got hired there. Um, Robert and Mark, uh, bottom left and top right with a creative duo, uh, were very kind again. And what I learned at Rainey's, which I think is important to say here, is a lot of these creative conversations can all be about creativity and whatever. But I learned the power of creativity to literally grow a business. So these guys understood that you're only as good as the business you pull in. You're only as good as the work you make for the new brands you speak to. And I very, very quickly became accustomed to the idea that what we did had the power to bring that in. And I think at that point, and even now, there's still a disconnect between people believing and understanding that creativity can make money. There isn't just this side effect of our industry. And I thought that was really powerful. Um, I was then obsessed with heroes uh, uh, and following people. And at that point, design obviously was still my thing. Um, a guy called Paul Belford, who I'm sure loads of you know, was over at AMV uh, and was making work that looked like this. And I thought that this stuff was phenomenal. Um, you know, it didn't look like advertising. It started to sort of touch on, on art and all that other stuff I fantasized about. And ultimately people were responding to it in a really, really powerful way. And I got obsessed with it. So a little bit, I guess, find heroes, find villains, and then go and work with them. Um, I went over to AMV to work with Paul, made a couple of bits of work on this page with him um, and learned from him and, and, and Nigel, who were the creative directors at the time, there was loads in there to learn. I also learned what I may not want to be as much as what I did want to be. And there were some facets of leadership at AMV at that point that were very old school, very hierarchical. Design was very much a below stairs thing. Um, and I found that to be, I guess, difficult. And I sort of thought, although a lot of this was design led, there was still a massive hierarchy in that place. And I vowed to myself, OK, I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to do that. I learned from that and I thought, well, that's got to change because surely the more people, a bit like me with ambition who want to do it, that you let in, surely the better the company's going to be. And they almost had the opposite point of view. Um, I then went back to a place called United, which used to be HHCL, which was honestly one of the most progressive agencies of its time, to work with these two from Rainey Kelly who went there. That was cool. Um, Robert but uh, below left had enough of working with Sky at that point and borderline shot the client. So then the whole thing folded and they got bought by Gray. At that point, Gray was where you go to die, mate, was what um, they said about Gray. I said, oh, they've been bought by Gray. Should I go? What do you think? And they were like, mate, Gray's where you go to die. Um, so it was bad. It was about 120 people. 85% of its client list was, was Proctor's. It wasn't great. Um, and at this point, I'd kind of been on this sort of journey moving out of design into creativity um and it essentially got to a point where i was actually starting to oversee stuff i'd been running a music and design consultancy on the side and i was getting kind of frustrated because i was near a point where i thought i was able to lead creatively certain projects and stuff but still hadn't found an environment in which i thought i could do that right um this is a guy called david Patton who joined as ceo of gray at that time and weirdly, I don't think any of this would have happened had Gray not been so shit. So um, David was an ex-Sony client. He made Sony balls, PlayStation Mountain, Double Life. Like his reel as a client was probably better than most people's reel as a creative. Um, and he joined and his frustration had been around the fact that the creative process had been locked behind doors, you know, and that everyone was like, you know, no, 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 wait until I'm ready. And he was like, can't I share in it with you? And he thought that there was this massive barrier and divide between the client and, and agencies. It was a problem. Um, he also hated, like with a passion, the dick swinging sort of that went on in places like that. And Gray, when he took over and when I joined, was full of some old school dudes, very much clinging to their power base. It was a very hard place to, to rise in. And I'd, you know, I'd only been there like two weeks and I was already like, oh God. And really what David taught me was the power of trust, right? Um, truthfully, most companies, creative companies, are geared around the removal of trust to try and guarantee quality. So they'll introduce a sign off or they'll have, you know, you have to go and show this guy or that person or this woman or that guy. And actually what he showed me was the more people we trust, the more people you give rope to, 
the better the output. I'm just going to show you uh, an email I got uh, I, sort of three weeks in. I'd won a bit of business and I got an email from the then current creative directors. Uh, this wasn't the actual email, forgive me. We hate you and are threatened by you in some way, so we're going to behave like bell ends is the subject matter. Nils, we saw your work lately, want to pitch. That's quite good. And what we've worked out too late is that new business and cash are how you actually feed a creative business. The dusty awards we keep pointing at don't seem to have an effect on the declining fortunes of this agency. And instead of being really smart and embracing you, working out that we might have a load of stuff we could teach you, instead we're going to behave with a snobby, always slightly pissed air of wank. And here comes the actual uh, historically accurate part of the story. We're going to berate you in an email and demand you show us everything you're doing and ask our permission to create everything you create. And they sign the email off with the words chain of command. I thought to myself, what the fuck? We get to a point where someone was going to sign an email off with the words chain of command. Um, and that just taught me loads. And uh, really from that point onward, uh, myself, David and a few of the others went, right, we're going to break this. Um, and we did. And eventually, um, Gray ended up being a very good place. There's this quote I've always loved, which is sit by the river long enough and the body of your enemy will float by. Uh, it sounds quite dark. The truth is, um, whenever you're encountering anybody and you will encounter them that deal more in hate and deal more in fear, don't worry about it. Do your thing. Sit by the river, do your job and they'll float by. This is a guy called Tor Mirren who was running Grey New York while I was running London. Um, he was a really inspiring figure. And, and in America, creative leaders are more common. But, you know, my version of sitting by the river is do your thing to the best of your ability and don't deal in hating, debating, or justifying your ambitions. Tor said it different. He just said famous work solves all your problems. And he was a master. And he would just throw it away and be like, famous work solves all your problems. He would just say it like that. And, but it was actually genius. Because it's like, if you have a problem with your pay, if you have a problem with the place you're working, if you have a problem with the person you work for, make famous work. You can transform it, you can leave, you can um, go and do your own thing, you can get paid more, like it will solve everything. So this idea of sitting by the river, making yourself independent, making work that is famous, and then using that to do what you wanna do, just struck me as really good. Um, so with that in mind, here's some complete bullshit pushed by creatives about creativity. One is that creativity is this craft. Um, that we retreat to be creative. I just never really believe that. Um, I think craft is a part of creativity, but the actual act of creativity is not a craft. It should be open and brash and talky and all completely silent, but it isn't this sort of noodly thing that you need a beanbag to go and do. Creativity isn't an office. Back in the day when I was mentioning all those guys, it marked you as a creative if you had an office. There were hierarchies and levels for some reason, and it absolutely showed me that it wasn't about that. Um, I kind of mentioned this, but I think this is really potent, which is the career path of dependency. When we start, you know, as placements or juniors, how many apps, right, can we all use? Think about it. And all, everything here on the left, all the way down to making tea at the bottom there, if you see that icon, of course, as a placement, bless you, you have to do all that shit. Um, making tea, by the way, is still a powerful uh, app to have. Um, what interestingly happens is the more senior we get, we kind of step away from the tools in inverted commas. So we weirdly think that as management, our role is to do less and less on the actual tools. So we, you know, middle weight, we kind of stop cutting our own films. We stop building our own sites. Creative directors actually stop designing and just come in with roles of photos they've taken to the point where a CEO basically sends emails. Um, I'm not saying that this doesn't happen, um, you know, kind of by its nature because leadership involves different things. But if you think about it, the less you can do, the more dependent you are. And nothing brings this into more sharp relief than starting a company. So when I started Uncommon, it was massive to me that I could design, that I could edit and all these other things, because if I didn't, I needed other people to do it. And so my advice here is never, ever stop learning these things. They don't in any way make you more junior or subordinate. In fact, they make you powerful and independent. Um, biggest strand of this is everyone talks a lot about bravery. Um, you know, you need to be brave to think differently and how brave of them to do that. Um, I think that's kind of bollocks. My wife has this statement, which she's always said, which is you don't get to talk about bravery. Firemen get to talk about fucking bravery. You make ads for cheese companies. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that's probably fair. Um, the truth is, I think our role is to remove the need for bravery. We need to find a way to make conversations and workplaces where bravery isn't even a subject, where we just find a way to understand that difference and fame are a way to make a difference. At its best, I don't think creativity is this thing we noodle. I think it's what we do to survive. 
like the most radical acts of creativity are survival mechanics. And I think that's huge. Uh, look at this, you just literally can't hit him. When we're in the shit, when we're frustrated, when we're battened down or when we're suppressed, it is when we're at our most creative. We find ways out, we are at our most radical. And I think that's a really powerful sentiment. Sometimes the barriers can push us forward, right? Nothing, we ain't gonna do nothing. It's mine now. Whack! Um, I love that. So who was it who thought, right, that, that when someone keeled over choking, I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll empty the middle out of a pen and I'll whack it in their throat in order to create an airway uh, and save their life. I know that's a mental example, but if you think about it, that's a total fuck you to death, right? That is an act of creativity, which is in that moment, they have gone beyond anything they think is normal in order to save that person's life. This, similarly, you know, the story of the Spanish Armada, hopelessly outnumbered by the Spanish, sexy pirate Drake then decides, I'll tell you what I'll do, instead of just going out to fight them or not fight them, I'll set fire to our own ships, sail them into them in the wind and hope it scatters them all. You've got to be mental with a smaller fleet to go and do something like that. I also just love showing a slide that says, fuck you, King Philip II on it, forgive me. Um, but if you think about those two examples, they are a little bit um, indicative of what I mean, right? The truth is closer to home, Spotify wouldn't exist if the record industry hadn't been screwing us. So, you know, it used to cost 14 quid for a CD. You had to buy it. The artists got no money and Spotify were like, hang on a minute, we're going to change that. That's a reaction in a frustrated way to what the world was doing. The music industry was ripping everyone off. So Spotify, renting property was a minefield. So Airbnb, you know, local taxis were rank and unsafe. So Uber, big banks are pissing everybody off. So Monzo. Cable TV was drip feeding content like a crack dealer. So Netflix, you get it, right? All of these are stories, I suppose, about frustration and that impending need from someone somewhere to change it. And I think that's real creativity. Um, at Uncommon, we have this quote we've always loved. It's from Death of a Salesman. I'm not interested in stories about the past or any crap of that kind, because the woods are burning. There's a big blaze going on all around. Um, you know, he uses it in the book to basically say to people, all oh, right, you know, uh, the speed of change is coming. But instead of everyone going, oh, I know it's changing. You know, he says look, the woods are burning. I want you to feel the burning and the power and the fear of these woods. It always struck us as a brilliant quote in our industry because um, our industries felt like it was like, oh yeah, speed of change. But no one really recognized that. No one was really shifting what they did. Um, and we sort of felt like we wanted people to feel that the woods were burning. Truthfully, it's now in our creds because we don't think the world has ever felt so much like this. So, you know, I think we all feel uh, very tender, a bit fragile, a bit unsure of where it's going. Um, and like the woods in every sense of burning. Um, and, and we think that's a powerful time to be doing what we do. People wouldn't care if three quarters of brands disappeared tomorrow. These are the woods burning closer to home. So actually three quarters of brands guys could disappear from shelves and no one would give a shit, um, which tells you everything you need to know. I love the middle one. Ikea's head of sustainability said, we've reached peak stuff. This is the idea in the West that for the first time ever, we have enough things. We don't want more things. We want a different relationship with the things in our lives. You know, and then lastly, in the ad industry, people are paying money to avoid what we spend our lives making. And I think this is really, really pertinent, um, you know, and actually just tells us everything. Actually, if you look at it a bit closer, the ads are as good as the programs on telly. They asked people, do you look forward to the ads as much as the programs? And in 1991, people said yes. They actually look forward to the ads as much, if not more than the telly. Now, of course, we're in a very different place where we're paying to avoid them. Banksy, coining it perfectly. People are taking the piss out of you every day. They butt into your life, take a cheap shot at you and disappear. They're on TV making your girlfriend feel inadequate. They have access to the most sophisticated tech the world has ever seen and they bully you with it. They're the advertisers and they're laughing at you. you know, this is our most prominent artist talking about us. Uh, and I think we have to listen to that. And I think we have to shift what we do. At Uncommon, we made our premise to work with the world's most ambitious people to build on common brands, um, you know, and we think they work a different way and have a different relationship with the world, or we're gonna make them ourselves. Um, so one of the things that differentiates us was I was sick. As you know, dependency is a big thing of trying to get brands to do the right thing, trying to shift brands through what we did to do the right thing. So we started making our own. We launched a brand called Halo Coffee. It's a completely compostable version of Nespresso. Um, you know, and that was a really interesting exercise, about three years old now. Um, and finally actually starting to work, which is great as a business. But again, a great example of going out and I suppose trying to remove our dependency on the brands around us. Um, 
you know, the capsule coffee market was average and killing the planet, so Halo. Someone once asked me, how do we go from being a company that makes shit uh, for people, you know, that hopefully people will buy, to being a company that people in the real world wish existed? And I thought that was an amazing question. Um, you know, and it's a brilliant question for a brand. I was like, oh my God, how do I turn you into a company that people wish existed? Truthfully, it's a massive question for us. And I thought that that was even more pertinent. How do we go to being companies that people in the real world are glad exist rather than kind of perverted advisors, which is I think a little bit what we are at the moment whispering in our clients' ears. It's never been something I wanted to be. I want Uncommon to be a company that people in the real world are glad exists. Um, I'm not going to do this one. This is a, a sort of theme on creativity. I'd much rather hack to questions, I suppose. Um, but really what I'm trying to say is that I think mostly we should be looking for the stuff that pisses us off personally and channeling it into our vision. Biggest thing about creativity, there'll be all sorts of craft. You can learn all sorts of tricks and hacks, but taking it personally is one of the biggest lessons you could learn. This is the first piece of work we made at Uncommon. Um, and if I'm honest, you'll hear it in the quote here. There's a quote from Network in here. Um, it's probably the thing that defined Uncommon straight out of the gates. I do not believe in climate change. Global warming is not happening. Therefore, we are climate change. So there will be evidence for the UK. Where is your evidence of global warming? They are pulling out of the historical record. so yeah we did all that um really the reason i'm showing you that is in our minds i couldn't quite believe that we've managed to get slayer our favorite speech and any ad about the environment and shift a brand to go and sell that environmental cause um in a, in our first piece of work and actually it really reinforced to us that our point of view on the world not just on our category is really powerful so you guys if you're hearing this demonstrate your point of view on the world it's not divorced from the job that you do um I won't play that again we did it with the guardian that very much felt like an uncommon point of view as much as theirs and it's important to share i think with your clients or your brands that you work with your view um lastly sort of some some last things what we do making famous things is our most powerful gift and our magic i suppose so don't give it away idly uh be careful who you work with never mind what they're going to pay right do they deserve it and, and we in this industry have got to a place i think where we are a little bit obsessed with um you know i suppose what we might be able to do for people and, and winning business and all that sort of stuff um and it just sort of dawned on me that actually we should be focusing far more on whether or not we should work with them you'd be surprised the power of no uh, uncommon has said no a lot in our first two years um and everything we've said no to has made something else appear that we were much more grateful for and much more suited to long and the short of it is that fear and and all of our fears around everything we do is an overused word for worrying about what someone else thinks. I'm not gonna play you this. The long and the short of it, guys, is that any part of change, any bit of education, any new job, there's gonna be haters. And learning this is the hardest, I think, lesson. Um, certainly was for me. Creatives just want, um, really, most of us, to be liked, to be appreciated, uh, flattered for our work, to be celebrated. That doesn't happen all the time. And even the best bits of work, even in the public or even in your organization, someone will find a way to look down on it. It's a weird side effect of our trait to find a way to not like things. And there will be haters and you must, I think, think hard about how you're going to get through those moments and stick to your vision. Um, ultimately, some people won't get it. And there's a lot of talk of bring everyone with you. But actually, I've always loved this quote, arguing with idiots is like playing chess with a pigeon. No matter how good you are, the bird's going to shit all over the board and strut around like it won anyway. Some people are just going to shit on the board, man. And honestly, how you find a way past those people is down to you. Um, it always sort of dawned on me that um, there was a journey that people went on, which, uh, hang on, I've just got a text here from, it's a bit weird. 
<laughs> I'm getting some stick for my haircut. Uh, I've always loved this um, the journey that people go on, which is like, think of any hero you love um, and, and, you know, pick them, whether it's like Elon or Vicky Maguire or whoever it might be. Um, there's a journey that they've gone on, right? And it starts out and they're mad and they're purely mad. Uh, and then they're crazy. And then this is my favorite bit in the middle here. They're arrogant, right? Uh, they're arrogant enough to think they could change things or arrogant enough to think they can change their own situation or the way things are. And then there's a no hang on moment. And then they're brave, an innovator, a leader, and then a hero. But don't forget that every single person has a version of this, right? Change the fucking words. But we've all got a version of this. Uh, and I think that's really powerful. Um, sometimes I feel like giving up. Then I remember I've got a lot of motherfuckers to prove wrong. Has been something that I've always had stuck by my desk. Um, it's what gets me through. A lot of people wanging on about what the brand's purpose is. I'd love you to think about what yours is. I think that's far more critical and put it on a wall and make it get you through the difficult moments, make it get you through the barriers you need to break and the changes you wanna make. Print the posters you wish you could steal, shoot the films you wish you could watch, create the brands you wish existed, make the industry you wished you worked in. Um, that's ultimately this. Wrote this recently for the crisis, but I wanted really to just read it to you lot. In a crisis, it's tempting to retreat. The excuses we make for ourselves become more believable and the arguments not to act grow taller. But like Virginia said, you can't find peace by avoiding life. The only thing that can beat fear is hope. So create creativity is the ultimate act of hope. It's believing in something that hasn't happened yet. Cynics and haters are more fragile in a crisis because they're passengers. So you've got less to fear. One foot in front of the other. Go get them, smash it. We love you. I'm going to shut up now uh, and stop sharing my screen. Amazing. Hello? Thank you. I'm, I'm back. <laughs> Thank you, Nils. There was so much in there uh, to kind of unpick. And we've got some questions that are coming in, but do keep your questions coming uh, because we'll, we'll, we've got about kind of 15 minutes. And I want to get through as many as we can. So I'm just going to dive straight in uh, with a question from Karina Mark, who says you spoke about uh, your work with heroes. How do you persuade them to take you on? Uh, yeah. That's a good question. I mean, honestly, we never ever, any of us grow out of uh, flattery. <laughs> so, um, you know, Paul, Paul was interesting in that I think at that point, I talk about Paul Belthood, but he was making work that obviously appealed to designers in a massive way. And um, I just got in touch and I found a designer that I'd worked with before who was working with him and said, what do I have to do to go and meet this guy? I completely re-engineered my portfolio so that it was full of, you know, Joseph Muller Brockman style uh, left aligned typography. Um, but because that was what I wanted. But I think I think you've got to find the people that make the sort of stuff you wish you could make. And you'll know in your heart how you're going to appeal to them. And people hopefully think that what we're doing at Uncommon is interesting. But there's a recurring theme in a lot of our stuff. There's a recurring theme in a lot of the work out of, you know, other brilliant places, be it Heatherwick. And, and so I think just find that suited bit of work. And you know, you'll find a way to get in front of the right people, but um, appeal to their sensibilities, show them that you're ahead of it. So people say to me, oh, well, how do you, how do you get on at Uncommon? Well, fame is a key part of our stuff. If you found a way to create a famous piece of work without needing a client, that honestly gets your first foot in the door at Uncommon, um, because that's what so much of our stuff's engineered around. I had another question here, which is about uh, what what should people do to kind of impress Uncommon if they want a job there? I think you've answered that one. Of that, make, that make probably, famous. Yeah, I think, but honestly, try and find a way to make something famous. Remove, make things. You know, we call ourselves a studio for a reason, but please make, whether that's a site, a film, a product, a brand, it's really impressive. And I think never been more impressive, our ability to make in this world. Um, and I think ideally... I don't know, you know, we're impressed by all sorts, but most people who tend to come have always got an eye on a brand of their own and have either made forays into that or help people launch others. They understand that um, it's all an illusion until it's real, if that makes sense. So like Halo was a box with nothing in it with a logo on it for about three weeks. And we were like, oh, the coffee's coming, the coffee's coming. But we had to convince ourselves it was going to be real. And then when we launched it, of course it was. And that's true of ideas, that's true of everything. So I think the more you think like that that it would impress people uncommon i'm sure i think that touches on our day's theme sort of practice over theory and which one of those puts you in a, a stronger position it sounds like the uncommon uh sort of angle would very much be about practice and about you know trying stuff out and you might not have run a business before or started a brand but give it a go and see, see what i just i remember this thing 
if you want, and I know I talk a lot about haters, don't I, and that stuff, it's a recurring theme, I know. If you want the ability for them not to matter and to never be a passenger, theory can only take you so far. You see it on Twitter every day, there's wanging on these threads of debate. I'm like, oh my God. Look, sometimes it's great, but the long and the short of it is if you've done something, you've done it. Um, <laughs> one of my kids uh, had a go at the other one of my kids and he said, it, one of them was laughing at this, this person running and this person was a bit overweight and he said, you don't get to laugh at the fat guy running. And we were like, what? And he was like, because they're running. And it's true, right? Like Brewdog went and made a load of hand sanitizer with us. And we had this idea for them. We said, go make hand sanitizer. And they got a load of stick for it because it wasn't quite right, first of all. And a shitload of people jumped up and down on, on their heads. And then someone beautifully just put, well, hang on a minute. They've made 50,000 units of hand sanitizer. that not quite right yet. They're about to make a million more. What have you done? And it was like, and you are insured against any of that if you make. So yeah, we would be firmly in the, um, in the less theory, more making camp. How old is your kid? That's so profound. Uh, yeah, they're harsh. I've got three boys. They're 15, <laughs> 12 and nine. Yeah. I've never said that, that thing about, you know, good on the person for running then. <laughs> yeah. Not a good job there. Um, so we talked a little bit about kind of heroes and mentors. You mentioned in your talk about the for find your villains and Donna Leishman has asked, what's the value in finding your villains? Know what you don't want to be. So, so um, and I think this is true of all heroes and I was trying to be really kind, but I was also trying to explain what I meant, which is what I think you do inherently when you go and work with the heroes, you kind of kill them. Because when you actually work with your heroes, they're not heroes anymore, they're people. And you work out the things they're brilliant at and the things they're not. And I think that's healthy. And take the things you love and promise to yourself you're not gonna do the things they don't do as well. And then build your version of events, I suppose. But villains are just as important. I don't know about everyone, but there are villains in my life who I don't know, who, who keep me going a little, who I like to imagine when we've done something pretty cool or we've done whatever, I'm like, yeah, if I can swallow that. Um, you, you know, there's stuff like that in life. And I think that that motivation uh, needn't necessarily be bad. And kind of carrying on that thread, a question from Christian, who uh, talks, asks, how have you dealt with strong creative egos? And I want to build on this by asking kind of specifically what those in more junior positions can do, because I think sometimes it can feel when you're taking your first steps in a company that, that it's hard to make your voice heard or kind of fight against some of those wrongs that you're seeing. What's your advice there? Um... It is hard, isn't it? Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm trying not to say bullshit. I'm trying not to say fucking the same old stuff. Align yourself with someone in a senior position who gets you. And that is like, that's a really horribly, it sounds like a horribly manipulative or true, but it's true, right? You've got to find someone at the top table who fucking gets what you do. At Gray, it was Neil Horston, actually, the planner, far more than any of the creatives who were like, oh, you're just really fast. You work like this. And he got what I did. And I thought I had loads to learn off him. And what he gave me was access in the briefest moments to a top table chat so that I could say, that's not cool the way that's working or what if we did it over here? And I think you've got to find someone, no matter who they are, that gets what you do and that can channel your, your vision if you're not able to do that yet in the room. Um, and then, like I said there guys, also just make, if you walk back into your agency or studio and you go, oh, by the way, have you read the Evening Standard yesterday? Yeah, check this out, we just did this thing. Honestly, you will have their attention. Um, and that is one of the biggest ways to do it. You know, I love it. A couple of guys at our place came back and were like, oh yeah, we just got this thing. It's just run in the Metro. I was like sat and it was like, Ooh, in here. I was like, oh, I love it. I love it to take me to school. It was so fucking good. So that feeling I think is irresistible and omnipotent. I think um, we have a question from Charlie and I think again you've sort of answered this in that question she says as an illustrator who wants to get into advertising and branding but's only ever had commissions as an illustrator what advice would you recommend to begin the change? Um, well, everyone in advertising looks for either clever visual ideas new styles so a genuinely new aesthetic somehow uh, or they look for stuff again that's got fame baked in so Ido Rodriguez you know great illustrator he did our Ovo posters famous for a load of uh, New Yorker covers um, you know, he's, he's found a way to channel politics and, and controversy into his work. Now, I'm not saying that's the only answer, but of course, things that do do that travel of their own accord. So a bit like all the other conversations, if you can make one or two of your illustrations famous because they beautifully capture an issue or a conversation, that will definitely uh, win the hearts of the industry. It all comes down to that sort of finding your purpose. I think so, yeah. I mean, Edel's done it to a point where 
he's honestly, you know, he, he's like on a one track mission to nail Trump to a cross, I think, um, because he's kind of, it, that's his thing, but I, he's got lots more to his bow than that. But I think that's the, the thing that's got his acclaim globally. And I, I think you've got to find your version. Malika Fevro, similarly, she's got her vibe very different, but again, all of her imagery travels, doesn't it? You know, in a beautiful way. Talking of, uh, on Wednesday, we've got an amazing talk from an illustrator called Amelia Durand, who is talking exactly about that, how illustration can have a sort of purpose and can communicate your message. So tune into that. Yeah, um, so sorry, just to speak to that a little bit more, because everyone's going on about, oh, you know, print and whatever are dead. We've never responded to simple visuals more than now. Instagram is rooted in that theory. We've never, ever responded uh, to icons more than we have now. You look back at the 60s covers of Esquire, you know, the soup can, Warhol, etc. All we're looking for now are beautiful, beautiful, pithy images that we can all send and relate to. I think illustration and, and logo design in that sense are critical now. You know, and Uncommon, we're desperate to try and do that. We don't do it as well as some, but the Black Butterfly for the Guardian, um, you know, the e cover work with the flower coming out of a pile of shit uh, and some other stuff. We're, we're trying to do that stuff too. And I think that's a critical part of the creative process now is finding an icon for your idea. Uh, I'm, we've, there's still questions flooding in. We've got about five minutes left, so I'm going to try and rattle through a few more. Uh, from Camilla Frankish, what's the process of accepting clients' work at Uncommon? And do you have a framework or process that decides whether you take it or whether you do say no? Yes, we meet them. Um, we literally meet them. And in the first five minutes, there's a really key thing, which is why are you here? And not enough people ask. We are usually in our industry, and I certainly wasn't great, so accustomed to just trying to win. I completely forgot to ask why they were in the room. Uh, and commonly we say, why are you here? And if their answer is, we saw this brilliant bit of work, or I saw you wanging on, or I read this thing, then that's great, because they know who we are. When they say, oh, you, someone mentioned you, you're on a list, whatever, we're usually like, no thanks. And I promise you that's a really, really powerful exercise, because you want the people who want what you do. So second to last question I'm going to ask is from Katie McVeigh. She says, what's the biggest creative challenge you've faced? Nice, easy uh, one. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, honestly, our company, our people, always, you know, that is a creative challenge because if we lose our energy or our way or stop progressing or stop being as diverse and different as we can be, everything is fucked. So that is a daily continuing creative challenge. And then final question from Lottie Lawson, which is touching on the kind of current situation. Uh, we can all see that you are, I'm guessing, at home at the minute. She yeah. says, do you think studios will be more open to remote work in the future or will talent still be recruited from a local talent pool? And what other changes do you think the kind of life post lockdown might bring to the creative industry? No, I love, I love, the, there's a part of our process that works brilliantly like this, particularly for creatives. So we can retreat to our houses now like never before, really craft our work and nail it. This bit works brilliantly, production is far harder, whatever you're producing, be it a product or sound or whatever, you need to be in the room together. That's what I've found, which is hard. So uh, I actually think it's a brilliant time to, to work in a very different way. I'm very open to working remotely with a load of people. So please do get in touch if that's the suggestion. Um, but I think the recognition is that we can go very fast in some ways, but simple conversations we'd have all been able to have together in the studio about a soundtrack, for instance, now take four and a half hours, uh, which is horrendous. So I miss it a bit. I also think physical culture is a competitive advantage. So I think despite all of the wanging on about this, if you want to be faster, know each other more, learn, uh, you can't beat being around people. So we're going to have to balance.